Let's see. So I did receive it and I can, I will put those in the chat when, um, when prompted. Okay, we have about 30 people, including the panelists now. So I'll give it a few more minutes uh, before I get started. Uh, and hopefully we'll add a few more people since it's just 6.30. Yeah, more people are coming in. That's all good. Kathleen, you're in stereo. Yes. Say that again. Oh, I'm I'm um uh, I'm just being lighthearted saying I have you in stereo. Yes, you do. <laughs> it's true. I guess you all can hear me. Yes, yes. we can hear you, okay. Dee. All right. Does anybody have any questions about whether they can be heard? Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I use a laptop where I can see a full screen of everybody on a Zoom when there are multiple hundreds, perhaps, of people. But the volume on my cell phone works best. So I use that as well. Okay, we're up to about 35 and hopefully still climbing. I'll start in a minute or two because what I have to say is probably the least important of what everybody has to say this evening. Again, thanks everybody, by the way, for agreeing to participate in this event. This is great. Thank I you, John. Really appreciate it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Attendance is still building, which is excellent. Um, oh, I forgot to get a pen. Okay, John, could you put the agenda back on screen so I can reference it in my introduction? Thank you. Sure thing. Okay, I'm going to begin. Since I put on my glasses to see what I wrote. Uh, welcome to the second forum of the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust, or Housing Coalition, sorry. My name is John Hornick, and I am the chair of both the Housing Coalition and the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Tonight's focus is on racial equity and housing. Racial equity has been in the forefront of national discussions with the deaths of George Floyd and many other Black Americans. The issues receiving the most attention range from community policing, especially with today's verdict, healthcare, jobs, and education. We could easily spend the entire evening <clears throat> on any one of these issues. But housing is an equally critical issue which too often, at least to me, appears to get lost in the shuffle. We have many distinguished presenters who will help us better understand the complexities of housing tonight at every level, but with particular emphasis on Amherst. You should see their names and our agenda on the screen now. I wanna thank the League of Women Voters of Amherst and the town of Amherst for once again co-sponsoring this event. We have a crowded agenda that will move along at a fast pace. To help us sustain that pace, we have asked Isolda Ortega Bustamante to moderate the program. Isolda has been a champion of equity and education throughout her career, working for different state and local organizations. She is also a founder member of the Racial Equity Task Force of Amherst. Isolda will be assisted by three people, 
John Page, my principal collaborator in the Housing Coalition, who will be monitoring the chat function in Zoom this evening. If you have a question or a comment, please put it into the chat. And as time allows, John will assert it into the conversation. We also have time reserved for public comments and questions later in the forum. I wanna thank uh, Rita Farrell, an expert housing consultant to the Housing Trust, who will help the speakers keep to pre-established time limits, and Nathaniel Malloy, senior town planner, who is hosting this web webinar and assisting some presenters in getting their materials on screen. Now it is my pleasure to turn the meeting over to our moderator, Isolda Ortega Bustamante. Good evening, and thank you very much, John Hornick and the team that organized this, uh, all of you who work together for these important issues. I don't think that we can uh, proceed as much as we're concerned with time without uh, a couple of acknowledgements. I think, uh, first of all, it's a very emotional moment, and I would like uh, to ask uh, simply for a moment of silence uh, even as we take in the verdict uh, and we uh, wait for some partial justice for the families of George Floyd, Dante Wright, Adam Toledo, Breonna Taylor, so many others. And if we could, I know for myself, um, just before coming here and what has been in our minds and in our hearts, if we could just take a moment uh, just of silence to acknowledge today. Thank you. I, I know that I could uh, use a longer moment myself. Um, very emotional day, very historic day. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, and thank you, especially John. Um, when talking about housing, an area that is, is not uh, an area of expertise of mine, um, I did think that it was important uh, to have uh, what will be my very first original land acknowledgement. I've relied too often on, on colleagues and friends. In this case, my colleague, uh, Jose Lugo from the Collaborative for Educational Services helped me. And I just want to one minute acknowledge that we are present on the ancestral lands of the Nipmuc and Pocumtuk and acknowledge the lands of the past, the present and future descendants of our neighbors. To the east, represented by the red, the Nauset, the Wampanoag and Massachusetts. To the west, represented by the white, the Muncie, Lenape, and Mohican. To the south, represented by the blue, the Mohegan, Quinnipiac, Wappinger, and Narragansett. And to the north, represented by the black, the Wabanaki, the Pinacook, Aransaguntakuk. And it is on this land with these past, present, and future neighbors in our hearts that we welcome all of you to this shared space of learning and action. John has shared in the chat a tool that you can take with you. Uh, the first one, you can type in any address and it'll show you the native uh, tribes and uh, languages that were present on the land. And, and the other one is simply an example of um, indigenous people uh, today in these lands. And in this space tonight, uh, we center and stand with our black brothers and sisters and folks as you bear the brunt of the physical, emotional and spiritual impact of continuing police violence layered on the generational trauma of racism. Your basic human rights continue to be under attack. We name this oppression and aspire to be co-conspirators for your humanity and dignity. We are here tonight with our hearts as well as our minds on the continuing struggle for civil rights and with each of you as friends and neighbors we may not know yet. Tonight we turn our focus 
on the, to the basic human right to secure and safe housing and begin with part one of the forum, a history of discrimination. And uh, to begin, uh, we're very lucky to have with us tonight, Whitney Demetrius, who is the director of the Fair Housing Engagement for the Citizens Organization. And April is Fair Housing Month. And uh, Whitney will be talking with us. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't say the full name of your organization. Director, direct, Fair Housing Engagement for the Citizens Housing and Planning Association, CHAPA, C-H-A-P-A, a statewide advocacy group. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you so much, Isolda. I am really excited um, to be here. Um, and thank you for centering us in our conversation today and, and taking a moment to recognize the moment uh, that we are in um, as we begin to have this particular conversation. Uh, John, I'll ask that you stop sharing your screen so I can share mine. And, and I'll begin to present with you for you all. Um, let's see here, hopefully you can see this, okay? You'll let me know, can you see that? And you can probably see my entire screen, but um, nonetheless, so I'll, I'll get started. And, and, and ex again, as I mentioned, I'm really excited and happy to be here to really talk about racial equity uh, and housing. And thank you for that context as you laid it out, sort of really being able to identify how these, uh, these issues are really overlapping, right, with housing. So who is CHAPA and what do we do? Our mission is really to encourage uh, production and preservation of housing that's affordable to low and I dare say no and moderate income families um, and individuals to foster diverse sustainable communities right through planning and community development and so what I'm excited about in my new role as Fair Housing Engagement uh, Director is really to provide technical assistance, right, to start these sort of coalition efforts. So excited and happy that the Amherst Housing, Affordable Housing Coalition has invited me here into the space. Um, and I, it's been a pleasure to sort of work alongside you all, John and John and, and Kathleen and others here um, in doing this sort of work. But additionally, my role is really to um, expand and work with other agencies and developing the field around um, fair housing uh, specific strategies. And I'll talk a little bit later as John alluded to, uh, to our legislative priorities at CHAPA. So I'll center our conversation really in that um, equity and access and inclusion, right? Are all sort of central, right? Housing choice is what we're really talking about. Do you have housing choice? Can you afford to live here? So not just housing affordability, but also can you afford to live here in every aspect of the word, right? What does it mean to live in a community? What uh, sort of safety and level of comfortability and welcomeness do you feel in living in a community? And so as we think about housing, it's really central to your life in terms of access to health and education education and jobs and healthy foods and transportation and, and onward and, and onward, right? And so these inequities that we see are really a, a series of deliberate and intentional realities, right? So zoning, restrictive covenants, uh, segregation, Jim Crow laws, redlining, um, you know, over discrimination, right? Sorry, my screen's having some <laughs> issues here. But what we are, what's, what's important to note is that in reversing those impacts, we must also be as deliberate, right? So when re-examining local preference and affirmative marketing plans and housing as reparations and moratoriums and inclusionary zoning and local for housing committees and housing plans, analysis of impediments, diversifying your housing stock to bring more diversity in your homes, creating communities that are welcoming, right? So when you're thinking about doing all of this, you must be deliberate. And now I've thrown out a bunch of tools and terms, which some of which I'll talk a little bit about, but really to just give you context as to if you are doing things, are you looking to undo sort of intentional acts, we must be intentional and deliberate about how we undo that. And so um, as, um, as Adola mentioned, April is for Housing Month, right? Uh, April 11th, 1968, it was written into law, uh, sort of as a civil rights law, um, by President Johnson, really seven days after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And so what's important to note about when this was uh, put in place 
is that it was an inflection point, right? Much like the inflection point we find ourselves now uh, in our current moment in history, right? And so uh, where the country was, was burning in many ways, right? People were upset and looking for change. Um, and really the act in many ways was symbolic, right? And in, in terms of it being passed, but really prohibits discrimination based on sales, rental, financing, any sort of housing related transactions relates to race, religion, and national origin. And then later expanded to include some federal enforcement provisions. Um, gender was later added in 1974 um, and then disabilities and families with children in 1988. And so I share this video that for those who might want to um, watch it later, it's about the nationwide seven days, nationwide seven days, the seven days after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What was happening particularly in the country, right? This inflection moment, similar to where we stand now, where it's an inflection moment for change. And I think that's a lot about what we've been seeing recently um, in terms of people wanting to think about what does it mean to create change? What should we be doing? What policy changes should we be enacting? How can we re-examine our local policies uh, to make our communities more inclusive? So I share that for you to, to dive in later. And what does this matter, right? Housing matters. Uh, it, it mattered then and it matters now because as I mentioned, housing is connected to so many aspects of our life. And it's part of the reason why for so many years they've been trying to get in, they have been trying to get this law passed uh, prior to 1968, and it was unsuccessful. And really because I think people understood that if they changed that, so much of our livelihood would be integrated and, and changed. And so I wanna give some context to um, Amherst housing data, right? Um, just quickly, this is from MHP's Data Town website. And this really is um, useful for advocates as we do this work and understanding why does our community look the way that it does, right? So this first chart on the left is referring to um, the housing stock by the year it's been built, right? And so you'll notice in 1960, between 1960 and 1999, a lot of housing had been built. And so I share that in the context of uh, lead paint issues, right? Where Whitney, there are, yes, am I at time? Two minutes. <laughs> okay, great. Two minutes. Awesome. So I share that in the context of um, lead paint laws and housing for uh, for families with children. Right? Are are we creating housing that is? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get my my thoughts back here. Sorry, Rita, but trying to get our um, our housing stock right to reflect the needs that are in the community for families with children. Um, if we know that um, oftentimes landlords are steering families away who have children under the age of six. So how that overlaps right with fair housing law. On the right, you'll notice um, the number of units um, um, being built, right? The, the types of units being built. And so you'll notice there's many single family detached right, that are being, um, that are built in Amherst. And so what does it mean to diversify the housing stock to get to housing diversity? How do you create the different options of housing so that more people will come and live and dwell and stay in your community? I also share this chart to really talk about the school age population as you see it decreasing after about a the early 2000s and onward, that number really decreasing. And what does that mean? What does it mean, this overall uh, context, housing context as to what is happening in Amherst and what um, is available for families? And are they being steered away, right? Um, populations by race. I share this to show um, sort of the diversity that is um, currently in Amherst, right? So you will see here that the majority is non-white, um, non-Hispanic white population, right? And so, and then the numbers really are overwhelmingly low on the other spectrums. Um, and so if you think about this in terms of this recent uh, case, I think it's back in 2016 that the Massachusetts Fair Housing Center um, did, looking at a particular property owner, right? And they are they were discriminating against families with children based off lead paint, 
right? And so some of their properties that they own were in Amherst. And what does this really mean, right? In this overall context of housing discrimination um, and, and what work really still needs to get done. So um, I share this in terms of, um, and I'll glaze through this because I think I'm at time, right, Rita? <laughs> um, and I'll share a little bit more as we talk about the policy work. But really what I'd like for folks to really get out of this is that Everyone is a member of a protected class, and there is certainly much more work that we need to be doing in the context of fair housing overall. Thank you so much, uh, Whitney. Um, I love this framing, can you afford to live here? And the historical placement um, and the current data um, and, masterfully integrated into a very short presentation, which I could listen to um, for much longer. Um, really appreciated also the demographic diversity. Thank you so much. And I really would love to learn in the Q&A discussion more about your advocacy work. Thank you. In this uh, second segment of part one, history of discrimination, um, exclusion of black people from Amherst housing. In the first part, we will hear evidence of, of an archival research report that Michelle Miller and Matthew Andrews have um, put together. Uh, Michelle Miller and Matthew Andrews are co-leaders of Reparations for Amherst and many other things that <laughs> we, uh, we leave out. Um, so we appreciate that. Thank you very much. And a preview that when uh, Michelle and Matthew are, are done, um, Demetrius Shabazz, will be presenting evidence from oral history of Black people in Amherst. And uh, Demetria is um, a doctor in communications and a faculty member teaching in various places, University of Massachusetts, Baypath, former president of Amherst Media and local celebrity. Um, I guess that's my cue to go. Is that, are we ready? Sorry, Matthew and Michelle, please go ahead. Yeah, great. Um, so we're, Michelle and I, as uh, Isolde mentioned, are with Reparations for Amherst. And our main um, objective is to acknowledge and recognize the crimes against humanity and the crimes against Black people that have been perpetrated in this country and specifically in Amherst and to um, support a path towards healing. And so what that's looked like as far as the research is looking at in Amherst, what is, um, you know, what is the nature of those crimes? And in order to understand the local uh, situation, which M Michelle will talk about in a little more detail, we really have to understand why it is that when we talk about affordable housing, often we're talking about uh, black and brown people. Um, and it's specifically when it comes to Black people, we all know about slavery, um, but there has been a structural, so kind of two um, paths, two concurrent systems that have created a significant um, loss of intergenerational wealth or an inability to build up intergenerational wealth for Black people. One of those is a structural system. So you have Plessy versus Ferguson which is the Supreme Court decision that says separate but equal. We are generally familiar with that. That's a structural thing. Lynching was a vigilante system. It was an unstructured, um, it was often sanctioned by the structures, but it was um, more arbitrated on an individual basis. And so both of these systems, systems of structural uh, suppression and disenfranchisement and active intentional violent suppression we're concurrently depriving black people of opportunities to build intergenerational wealth throughout this country, um, whether it's the GI Bill, when uh, you know, most of the um, home loans and mortgages and opportunities for education went to white people and black people were deprived of that, whether it's um, uh, um, <laughs> the uh, redlining, subprime lending, mass incarceration, um, you know, so many different uh, infringements on the, the normal natural capacity to build intergenerational wealth. 
So that leads to this moment where black people tend to have access, less access to wealth and capital to invest in something like a home. And so it's just, I know for, my, I know for myself, a person growing up in uh, a, um, an environment uh, that was mostly made up of white folks, I didn't quite ever think about or understand why it was that when you think about affordable housing, you think about black and brown folks. And so we have to get that context and bring that context into our consciousness in order to understand the situation in Amherst um, and, and how, you know, where things are today. So Michelle's gonna talk a little bit more about what we found, we found search, um, about Amherst's past leading up to the present and the, one of the present uh, statistics that we shared in our past research report is that 1.8% of all owner-occupied housing in Amherst is owned by Black families. And so that's just, that's just, you know, it's a significant difference when you think about 6% of the population being Black. That's, that's a major uh, equity disparity. And so we wanted to dive in and understand why that was. So Michelle, you can take it from there. Sure. And I think it's important to note that our data um, mostly focused on Black residents in Amherst. So just to note that uh, Matthew spoke about the owner-occupied housing. And um, we also found that a disproportionate number of Black households are rent burdened. That is forced to spend one third or more of their income on housing. Additionally, we found that according to the most recent Amherst Housing Production Plan, there was an unmet need for a total of 4,730 low to moderate income housing units. So uh, we saw it, um, we looked at a lot of different factors, but one of the things we wanted to understand is how Amherst became a white enclave and uh, whether it had always been a white enclave and what systems are in place now that perpetuate it um, to continue to be a white enclave. So we discovered that it in fact has always been a white enclave. And um, this is true for the university and for the colleges as well. So the population of black uh, staff and students has not uh, increased in any um, significant way over the years. So um, some reasons for that, and Whitney spoke to some of the uh, reasons, um, the explicit reasons. Uh, we, do, we did found racial covenants here in Amherst, particularly in the Blue Hills and surrounding neighborhood. And uh, that neighborhood borders the West Side Historic District uh, where um, African-American residents have lived historically. And so um, we also found a number of social reasons. And again, Whitney spoke to this idea of, um, you know, what makes one feel welcomed um, and so social reasons included any, you know, any spectrum from complete indifference toward black people to outright racism. Um, there are, there was, you can Michelle, see. Michelle. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Sorry. Fast. No, it's fine. Um, so uh, let's see, I want to pull out the most important things here. So I think uh, the other big finding we had is nimbyism um, and the prevalence of nimbyism in Amherst. So that means for folks who may not know, not in my backyard. And this is something that you can see um, back dating back to the 1860s. Um, at this time, it takes the form of opposition to affordable housing, which is what we're all here to talk about. Um, so uh, NIMBYism serves as a proxy for racial discrimination. And, um, and you know, that's, I think, part of a larger discussion we're going to have later about sort of, we uh, name ourselves to be 
progressive and to be of goodwill and individually we are. However, um, when it comes to uh, having affordable housing or opportunities um, for housing in our own neighborhoods, um, there we've, we've seen historically and up into the present moment opposition. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, and uh, Demetria uh, is going to be uh, beginning the section on uh, the evidence from oral history of Black people in Elmers. Turning it over to you. Hello. <laughs> OK, so um, hi, everyone. Thank you, John, for organizing uh, this uh, forum. Lots to talk about. Um, I'm going to share my screen in my very short presentation because I think we have so much that can be shared and learned uh, through the panel. Let's see. Okay, everyone can see that, I'm sure. All right. So, you know, um, Thank you, Whitney Demetrius, for going through some of the history and then bringing it uh, locally, um, Andrew and uh, Michelle. Um, I just want to highlight kind of what we're talking about. And we say, you know, there's redlining and the covenants and this whole inequality having to do with housing. There, that's historical, but the legacy um, here in Amherst and everywhere else is that you don't have access to better education oftentimes because of this redlining and segregation in neighborhoods. That still continues. You don't have access to other uh, working and job opportunities. That still continues. Uh, healthy food options. You know, um, I think of my friends uh, in Amherst who are unable to uh, go to the grocery store, particularly if they have to take the, the bus, the PVTA, and there's a restriction on how many bags that you can then carry on the bus um, home. So, you know, they're having to go to Big Y or a stop and shop and can't afford to go to um, Atkins Farm. So these are things that create uh, continual inequalities, uh, health disparities, you know, not being able to access clinics, again, having to get on PBTA or, or what have you. And during COVID, we know that this was a particular uh, uh, problem here in Amherst. And then it creates this type of uh, social discontent that is historical, but of course we have. So I just want us to, to look at this uh, in terms of, yes, that's national, uh, but then what does that mean locally? If it will advance, there we go. So I think Michelle had mentioned uh, this district, uh, the Lincoln Sus Sunset Historic District that's now, um, a of course, this legacy of where Black people used to live. Hazel Avenue, as you could see here, that is now bordered by the field. This was an area in which working class, uh, middle class Black people once lived and owned these homes. That is no longer the case. Mainly the Bridges and Roberts families all lived along Hazel Avenue. Um, and so this was an area in which we could have had, as Whitney, Demetrius, and, and Michelle talk about, this investment in uh, the Black middle class and folks, you know, having some staying power here. Um, but that is no longer the case, of course. We could see this whole area that has been outlined as this historic district. This is once where uh, black folk lived and owned homes. Um, and that of course is, is uh, gone. And you don't have this collected stable black community anymore. I just want to, uh, um, 
begin by talking about some of the history that I've been collecting through the oral histories of Black folk and, and uh, African descendant uh, folk here in Amherst. Uh, Edwin Driver, uh, there was a story about him recently in the Hampshire Gazette. And um, here he's talking about when he first arrived, um, he's the first um, uh, African American to get tenure at UMass. It incredibly, he was here in 1948, uh, was here, uh, retired in 1987. He's still living. And he shares, you know, that there was problems of course, finding a place to live, just to, to rent. I have heard this also amongst black faculty in interviewing them. Uh, they talked about, you know, um, uh, having a lot of trouble when it came to finding places to rent during the 60s and the 70s. And, you know, I really feel this continues now out of scarcity, that scarcity that uh, Whitney uh, Demetrius was talking about and how black folk, black and brown folk are being priced out. Um, and this is how it works. This is a recent picture basically of what we have in uh, housing stock um, that uh, Whitney talked about. And then here's the prices of the homes. Imagine being a grad student or uh, a young family moving to this area and seeing this because you're going to do your research first, seeing this on the internet and trying to figure out, is this a place where I can live comfortably with my young family? Will I be able to pay the mortgage and they being priced out? What I have found uh, through uh, the oral history, now take this off now. What I found through the oral histories is that um, this uh, is something that is a legacy, but it has continued. Folks came here, whether it was during the 50s, 60s, or 70s, um, it was very difficult to find a place to rent or to own a home. They were priced out. Um, two minutes. Two minutes, great. That's that's all I need because I know we're, we're going to discuss this. Yeah, that, because we're going to discuss this more. Um, and when we look at this legacy, it sets up a continuation of inequality. Um, I don't like using the N word, but I think it's important that when we hear about this lovely historic district, the Lincoln Historic District, it was called the N word Hill back in the day. Okay, and it was called that because of the redlining that took place, that black people, some poor whites, the poor Irish, they could not purchase or rent a house that went beyond to, you know, some of the areas in Sunset, et cetera. You know, there was this line, this artificial line, and as Michelle shared with us, there was an actual covenant. This was not unique to Amherst. It was also in places like Levittown that were built for veterans, white veterans and their families that, you know, daily, I think there was daily city near Chicago. This was very similar to what happened here. And so there isn't, because we haven't issued a corrective, whether you want to call it reparations or whether you want to call it simply trying to correct the past. Black folk, black and brown folk can't afford to live here. The ones that do, do so at a cost. And I really believe that if we want to save this town, because people aren't moving here, people middle income, we need to provide some incentive, offer a corrective, you know, let's call it reparations for what occurred and uh, get things right in Amherst. Thank you very much, Dee. Um, just looking at the, at the arc of, of this section is so interesting that you started with Plessy uh, versus uh, Ferguson. I really uh, appreciated that, Matthew. And, and moving through, through the data uh, quickly, Michelle, that, that you talked about the, the history of the enclave and the redlining, and then Dee bringing it uh, to an individual level uh, was really humanizing uh, so many of the trailblazers, uh, what, what I say are the people who I call our pioneers, who um, 
you know, really uh, went through what it was uh, to try to live here in those years, uh, breaking through all of those barriers. And um, also I wrote down the, uh, where you said social indifference. And uh, definitely we should touch on that later. What it, what it is to feel welcome, other people have mentioned and what that means even, even today. Um, both the legacy and the present, uh, we're, we're really clear uh, in that. And I'll, uh, we could personalize that to the present um, in, the, in the Q and A. Um, we're going to move forward and to part two of the agenda. Um, moving forward, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And this uh, third uh, panel is on assuring access to affordable housing, both existing and new. And uh, we have uh, three people speaking now. Um, thank you uh, for being with us. Keith Ferry is the president and CEO of Wayfinders, which um, you, some of you may have known years ago as, as HAP, um, a very, uh, you know, I would say uh, preeminent really housing organization uh, in the Pioneer Valley. Um, you know, I just cannot uh, state that enough. Uh, Wayfinders lights pathways and opens doors to homes and communities where people thrive. And, and we appreciate you being here with us uh, tonight. Keith is joined by Jane Lockler, the Executive Director of Valley Community Development. Um, thank you. And we'll, we'll come back to, to you in a moment. And of course, John Hornick, the Chair of the Amherst Municipal um, um, Housing Trust. Uh, but to, to start us off, um, Keith, I believe, will be focusing on the recent regional housing analysis report from the UMass Donahue Institute, highlighting the findings. Um, thank you so much, Keith. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to share um, and to be part of this conversation, which is so important as this, at this time to think about um, where we've been, where we are, and where we'd like to go. Um, so I really appreciate the, the, um, the arc of this conversation in that regard. Uh, and there's always good time to spend in each one of those places um, as we think about the way forward. Uh, the housing study, uh, the Greater Springfield Housing Study is, is part of thinking about the way forward from my perspective. It was actually undertaken in the pre-pandemic times with a desire really just to understand uh, and better document what was happening regionally in the housing market where rents and prices increasing. Um, were demographics shifting? Um, was there uh, enough housing supply for the region and what kind of condition was it in? And so the first phase of the report, which I'll share with you today, uh, some findings from include economic, demographic and uh, housing indicators for the region. Um, so they're at a regional level. So we're gonna zoom back out from where everybody was. We got way down uh, to a to, to uh, neighborhoods here in Amherst, but we're gonna zoom back out and see that the regional context currently is, is, is the same as it is here in Amherst. And in, in fact, reinforces some of the patterns. Um, so as we think about solutions, both here in, in town, we need to think also about the macro environment around us in the region. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and um, give you a little bit more background on the study for a quick second, as, um, um, as has been mentioned, uh, the primary research partner for us here in the study was a, is the UMass Donahue Institute. Mark Melnick and Carrie Bernstein are the uh, primary authors of this study and analysis. Uh, they've been working with me at Wayfinders and a um, the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts and a stakeholder group uh, of um, housing and community leaders from across um, the Pioneer Valley. So the study, uh, includes both Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin counties. And as I mentioned, the first phase of the study is demographic, economic, and housing indicators. The second phase uh, will look more closely at segregation and opportunity in the region, COVID-19 in housing, housing and supply and production. Um, and we hope to make this a, a repeatable study, um, either annually or semi-annually. And I think for us, this is a, uh, a bellwether year for many things, a reckoning year, an inflection point, as was said before, but we can use this as a benchmark for where we, where we are now and where we'd like to go and measure our progress toward that. Uh, it's modeled after Greater Boston Housing Report Card, which is an annual study. Uh, and um, uh, I'm only gonna be able to share a few slides in the time allotted today, but on uh, uh, next week, on the 28th, 
uh, we'll be having a community stakeholder event and I'll put in the chat the registration link for everybody um, and it's open to all. So again, this is a study area for the region, uh, for, the, for the study, I should say, um, Hampton, Hampshire and Franklin County, otherwise known as Pioneer Valley. And I wanna first talk about how people get housing in the region. And um, this was mentioned before with the uh, home ownership rate in, in Amherst of uh, people of color, the ownership rate of being um, about 30%, the figures that were given 1.8 to, to 6% of the population. And what you'll see here on the left is a very lot of, lot of information on the side, but let's just hang with me for a moment. You, you see on here on the left, Pioneer Valley overall um, in blue renters, 37% of households are renters, uh, where 63% are owners. Uh, that's pretty consistent with the, the Commonwealth overall. But as we shift over to the next uh, set of bar graphs here, uh, people of color, that's black and Latinx households in this case, um, in the Pioneer Valley, only 70% or I should say 70% of those households are renter households. Only 30% are owners. If you do the math with the, 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 the data that uh, Matthew, uh, I think raised before 1.8 and 6%, I just did it quickly, that's 30%. So it's consistent uh, with what we're seeing in the region and you see, but it's much more significantly um, uh, disproportionate to the Commonwealth where 63% of um, um, people of color our renters. Uh, so there's a big disparity there in terms of what we're seeing in the region compared to what we're seeing in the Commonwealth overall in terms of ownership. And I think that's important to point out. Um, people often think of Western Massachusetts as the affordable, uh, an affordable place to live, more affordable than certainly Eastern parts of Massachusetts. But we're talking about issues of affordability. So, well, and I'll go deeper into that. And what we see here is that uh, and so you would think home ownership would be more affordable and accessible. And we've heard already from folks that it's not here in Amherst and it's not for folks in the region. Therefore, people become renters often because of that case. Some people do choose to become renters. But you also see in the upper right hand corner of this slide, uh, and it, or if you go across the bar graphs, the disproportionality in terms of the impact uh, or in terms of the tenure, housing tenure, how people get their housing um, based upon race. So black households, uh, just a little less than two thirds in the Pioneer Valley are, are, are renters uh, and only 36% are owners. If you go to Latinx households in the Pioneer Valley, 77% um, are renters, 23% are owners. So when we think about um, that the housing tenure gap or the home ownership rate gap here, it's quite significant. And we know that directly correlates um, to family wealth and the racial wealth gap for many households. I wanted to sh share this as well in terms of looking at the other part of this and looking at poverty uh, regionally and, and compared to the Commonwealth. Again, we see in the Pioneer Valley higher rates of poverty than you do in the Commonwealth overall. And we see those disproportionately high for um, Black and Latinx households here. And then break them out across um, Franklin, Hampshire and Hamden County. Now there are, there are very few uh, black people in in Franklin County, but if you're um, but a high rate of them are uh, almost one in two are are um, below, at, at or below the poverty rate. I'll move on here to talk talk about income because when we talk about housing and affordability, uh, it's not only what the housing costs, what the rent is, what the, what the home price is but where, where your income is and whether or not that income is enough to sustain buying homes or renting in the community. And what's, what jump, jumps out to me here is that you see five figure increases over the five, five year period pre-pandemic for white and Asian households in income. But black and Latinx households, their income was flat during that time period, no measurable gain. So that's a real, um, um, and as we look at in the study more deeply, and there's lots in the study, what we see as a trend that we found, um, we wondered if that trend was, was true um, before we started the study, but we found that housing prices are indeed going up. Uh, that's gotten even uh, more severe during the pandemic where there's, um, uh, many people have read about it anecdotally, but the, if you look at information from the realtors and other, housing prices are going up. Uh, the Massachusetts Housing Partnership, um, recently um, issued a study of rents um, comparing uh, 
communities in Eastern Massachusetts and the city of Boston uh, and some um, gateway cities around the region and some other communities um, in Western Massachusetts. And in, um, in this region, it was found that rents were going up um, by five or 6%. Um, at the same time, we can certainly, we, we know incomes haven't been going up given the high rates of unemployment. And we know pre-pandemic where they were, incomes were flat, people were not seeing gains in their income. So when you look at housing affordability, it's that, that cost of housing and, um, and where people like people's incomes are. And here's a little bit finer point on that. Keith, two yeah. minutes. Yep. When, you, when we talk again, I'm gonna focus here on this slide about renters. I'm gonna focus on the bottom left here. There's a lot here to look at, but focus on the bottom left with me. Um, this is renters. This is looking at cost burdens for renters. Okay. Um, and if you look at um, Massachusetts overall, um, we have a high, it's an expensive state to live in. Um, half of renters are cost burdened, paying more than 30% of their income um, on, their, on their rent in this case. Um, and what we see in um, in 2010 is it's 51% and in 2018, it's basically unchanged at, at 50%. But what you'll notice there is that in the Pioneer Valley um, is also unchanged, it's about the same 54, 55%, but greater than the Commonwealth overall, again, higher. And then here in Hampshire County from 20, uh, 2010 to 2018, you've seen a, a measurable increase. Uh, from 52 to 55 percent in terms of households paying more than 30 percent of their uh, income on their rent. And who are renters? Going back to my very first slide, disproportionately renters, Black and Latinx households, right? 70 percent of them are renters. So when you're talking about being impacted uh, by the affordability crisis that uh, it was apparent before the pandemic and has only gotten worse during the pandemic, um, Black and Latinx households are, are, are showing it here. And then the, on this, on the 2010 to 2018, part of the chart on the right shows the households that are paying more than 50% of their income. That's called severely cost burden. Severely cost burden means that people are having to make critical uh, and um, severe decisions every day about whether they pay for their housing, food, medication, other things that their families may need. And what you'll see here in Hampshire County is that one in four families, 25% are paying more than 50% of their income for rent. That is not sustainable. That is not a way, um, um, is not a good place from which to be raising your family. Um, that is not a place to build wealth from. Uh, and as again, who are renters? Black and Latinx households are disproportionately renters in our region. So when you look at that, you see how impacted. And then on the top chart, you see owners. And you see owners, at, yes, they're cost burden, but at a much lower rate, um, comparatively. One final thing I wanted to talk about real quickly here. This is just another thing that was revealed through the study, housing supply. Housing supply is, in general, this is not housing affordable housing. This is, in general, in the region, uh, we currently have about an 11,000 unit housing supply gap. And we, if you look at household, uh, number of households and the, and the need for housing. And then if you continue that on a straight line basis to 2025, you'll see that that grows to about 19,000 units. And when there's a shortage or not enough housing, people of low incomes are gonna be uh, having the most challenge. And who are, and, and again, when we look at the poverty rate, we look at the renters, and we look at who are, whose incomes are not growing, and who are gonna be challenged in this environment. Again, Black and Latinx households are gonna be challenged to find housing that's adequate for themselves and their families in this, in this environment. So I'll leave it there. I think this, there's a lot to look at in the study. I will put in the chat again an invite to, and then a, a link to the larger study overall for you all. But I see this as a, as a place to build from for us, to think about how we use the new federal resources that are coming to the, the Commonwealth and hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, use the opportunity of things like the potential infrastructure bill uh, and new investments in housing, both locally with the affordable housing trust at the state level and federally uh, to, uh, to address these issues 
to solve for these issues in ways that we haven't been able to for decades. Thank you very much, Keith. That was very informative. And um, I'm really looking forward to actually looking through those slides. I think it, uh, you also mentioned an event on April 28th, which hopefully is, is in the chat. Um, there's a lot there to, to, to analyze uh, when you talk about the uh, amount spent on rent. Um, it immediately makes me think of the 51% of Amherst Public School kindergarten through sixth grade students who are African American and Latinx. And uh, the assumptions that are made about this area are often untrue because of the demographics that we see in the schools, both ethnic, racial, and economic, and how those families are affected by, by this incredible slide that you just showed. I need, I want to reintroduce uh, Jane Lockler um, because you know the Valley Community Development Corporation is such a key organization in our area. Um, seeking to empower low and moderate income people and underserved populations to manage and improve the quality of their lives. Um, and it's really an amazing uh, breadth of programs that you offer, Jane, from housing services, affordable housing development, and small business development. Um, so we really appreciate um, having you here. And the, um, as, as Keith said earlier, the looking forward to solutions so thank you. And John, reintroducing John, um, our organizer and host chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. In this discussion uh, period, uh, we're asking the question, how do we assure that there's adequate and appropriate outreach to communities of color? Both new affordable housing developments when uh, those come online, uh, but also later as, as units come online. So both the the development uh, side of it, and then when units are actually available, um, will they actually be made available? And how will that work when we see these tremendous disparities that, that Keith was just sharing? Jane, why don't you go ahead? Sure. So I think uh, I'll just talk a little bit about, um, I think that the panelists have just done such a great job to describe the global issues we're facing and the local, both regional and very local in Amherst. Uh, and Valley is right now sitting in a position where we have gone through a process of facing NIMBYism, having incredible support uh, from many great folks in Amherst, but also facing fierce NIMBYism and um, enduring that and getting approval on an affordable housing project. And to the point of this question, what we now face is the challenge of outreach and what does effective outreach look like? And I think that the one of those challenges is about uh, in, in the population that we have, it is up to us, the white folks, to figure this out because we need to identify the effective means of communicating and building relationships so that we find the folks that are not going to find their way easily to us or are going to believe they're not going to have a chance. Mm -hmm. And we need to find the avenues of communication, which are not the mainstream social media. They are about building one-on-one -on -one relationships, individuals in the community, between organizations in the community. But then I think one of the key pieces of that is making sure that people get guided to the right landing place. And that means people can't just hear there's a new housing development happening, but how do you actually get to the place where the application is? How do you get the application where it needs to go? How do, you, how do people get in touch with our managers, our, our property managers and owners, other advocates, um, counselors and caseworkers who are out there who can connect people to uh, what it takes to actually get in line, get into a lottery and get into housing that we're making available. And I just think that it is our challenge to be, as Whitney pointed out, intentional and deliberate in that method that you know, we, there are affordable fair housing marketing requirements for us as a developer, but it takes so much more. I, you wouldn't believe how extensive we have to be in, in developing that plan. And it still will take so much more than that to reach folks. 
And I really think that the main piece there is for us to really think about the effectiveness of our one-on-one -on -one relationships, our voices as citizens, and how do we get that word out and make sure that we've got a great network that draws people in and all the way into the finish line of, of getting to us. So um, I, I just think that it's uh, important for us to know that that is about the work of citizens and um, the organizations in, in, in all of Pioneer Valley to get us there. Okay, thanks, Jane. Um, I'm going to talk about planning for a new affordable housing development, which the town of Amherst in collaboration with the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust is now undergoing. Um, basically, we're writing a request for proposals, which I hope will be published um, next month. And when you write a request for proposals, the goal is to try to embody in it all the requirements that will assure that whatever developer is selected and it could be Valley Community Development, it could be Wayfinders, or it could be a different developer, um, will achieve the goals that we think are important. And among those goals are assuring uh, access to affordable housing for low-income communities and particularly communities of color. So when we think about this, we really have one shot at it from the point of view of the Housing Trust. Whatever we put in the request for proposals is what will get carried into a contract with the developer. Once that contract is signed, we can't go back and say, oh, here's half a dozen other things we think you should do in order to do effective outreach. So we've tried to describe, having talked to various consultants, what it is we would expect a developer to do. And I'm gonna share that with you now. The, the minimum we expect the developer to do is to develop a affirmative fair housing marketing plan that at least meets the criteria for the Department of Housing and Community Development, which is the primary subsidizer of housing um, in the state. But we want to encourage developers, if at all possible, to go beyond that. And so we've put in some specific things that we hope would be included in their marketing plan. For example, we would prefer that plans for marketing include specific provisions for assertively reaching out through various media to low-income underserved households, particularly communities of color who may be least likely to apply, both in Amherst and even though the development is in Amherst, beyond Amherst. The successful plans might include partnering with prominent members of the Amherst Black, Indigenous, Persons of Color community, as well as organizations that have a history of engaging diverse communities. We expect that the successful developer will employ brochures that demonstrate a welcoming approach, possibly including photographs of households that show individuals and families of different races and ethnicities. We think that applications should be available both online and on paper. Um, there should be assistance, including language translation for applicants who have difficulty completing them. Um, other assistance should also be offered. We hope that by incorporating this language into the request for proposals, we will assure that the greatest possible access to low-income communities of color um, will occur both in Amherst and, as I said, beyond. Um, this is for a development at two sites, uh, the Old East Street School site and a new site on Belchertown Road, both in East Amherst, um, that will probably have 50 to 60 units. The good news is we think we'll be able to do this I think the problem might be that that's not enough units. Even if we make access uh, to these units to persons of color, including other low-income individuals and households, uh, that's not enough. Uh, as Keith emphasized in his presentations, there is a real shortage of production, production in the Pioneer Valley generally and specifically in Amherst. 
So we need to figure out how to go beyond that. And to be honest, it's not simply an Amherst government problem. It's a state government and a federal government problem. And I'm sure Keith and Jane would second that. Um, but anyway, I'm also curious how uh, both Wayfinders and uh, Valley Community Development try to work to assure that they do the same kind of outreach perhaps that I'm describing or other things uh, so that when new units become available or as existing units turn over, there is appropriate access to low income communities of color. Yeah, yeah. John, thanks for sharing that about your, your plans for the um, upcoming RFP. I think those all, all, are all kind of really good best practice and what you can do. I would think about one other thing to consider is timing. Um, it's often the case when people see a development up and nice and bright and shiny that it's too late. Um, um, and, um, you know, we um, are just finishing a project in Holyoke, Massachusetts right now. Um, there's 38 units. We did, um, we have partially occupied the building and we're, we have a second building we're building right now. Um, but we did our marketing for that back in October. Um, and um, um, we, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, we couldn't do some of the things that Jane was talking about. Uh, and because I do believe in, in true love there, I do believe in getting out there. I, when I started my career as a in tenant and community organizing, I believe going door to door is, is key and, and, and meeting with people and, and connecting with folks in the community at the, um, but we got to use all methods possible. So we, uh, and, and because those were not as easily accessible to us because of the pandemic, we did a lot virtually. We reached thousands of people, many more than we would have um, had we um, used our conventional methods of doing a few um, um, information sessions um, and sending out some, some mailers. Um, so we, we ended up with 1,300 applicants for 38 units in Holyoke. Um, so again, no, we don't, we, our housing supply is in great, great shortage in the region. We have to do much more. Uh, I'm hopeful again, look, moving forward and thinking ahead that um, we can be working together regionally and locally here in Amherst um, to think about how we harness the resources now being made available and hopefully through, uh, uh, fingers crossed, an infrastructure plan that includes housing where we can do even more. One thing I wanted to mention your point about housing once it already exists and how do you know when there's a vacancy and other things that that is even uh, even harder trick. Um, there is though uh, one uh, again it's a virtual thing and again this is not virtual is not the way for everybody. In fact, you, you cut out many people who don't uh, have the access and we know access to technology and uh, mobile devices and all those things are are an, an, a real problem for many communities, for low-income communities, for people of color in many parts of the region uh, and undoubtedly here in Amherst. But uh, there is a, an effort um, that is uh, nearing kind of implementation right now called the Housing Navigator Project. Uh, it's called, uh, you find it at, I'll put it in the chat. Um, it's Massachusetts based, um, uh, many folks are involved in it. Um, um, from the state to um, other housing organizations in the state to list all of the affordable housing in the state um, so that you can find it. There is no comprehensive place where that list exists today. It was created because that, that didn't exist. Um, and the, the first order of business is to um, create a searchable um, uh, source that people who help people with housing navigations and ha housing uh, search um, whether it be at Valley or um, at Community Action, Pioneer Valley or others, could actually go in and find that. The general public could find it as well, um, but often um, they may not even be aware of it. So one of the things what we'll need to do once that is up and running is to make sure that people know about it and then use that resource. Um, and Whitney just put that into the chat. Thank you, Whitney. Uh, so that is right now they're, what they're asking is starting to ask affordable housing owners and developers around the region to list all their housing there so they can keep track of it and keep track. And that's where a place where they can put their listings as well. So there is, and that's when you'll know they're affordable. If you just look on open market, you may not know when housing is affordable or not, but these will be affordable housing developments. As you'll know their income restrictions and who they're designated for. So there'll be information there that I think will be important. 
uh, to reach in communities and, and keeping that uh, awareness up. Um, but I think it's about consistent communication, early communication, uh, and using all means necessary um, to reach communities. Dan, did you want to add to that? Okay. Yeah. And I, I, this is an exciting uh, announcement, and I don't, you know, I'm sure that uh, others were aware of it, uh, John. Um, so it's it's really the the construction of affordable housing. And we, we didn't get to, to talk about and could do in the, in the discussion period, um, really the opposition to approving affordable housing. We sort of glossed over that. And so just to say, you know, you're talking about two sites, Old, old uh, East Street uh, and Belchertown uh, Road. And, um, and it's just very, you know, I think it's worthwhile to, to talk about opposition to projects that, that has existed, and then looking um, to the future um, about that opposition, and then going back uh, to Whitney's uh, presentation, everything that every single one of you just said about uh, the lack of stock and the need uh, for state and especially federal action. So as somebody who was in the room when there was an ancient firehouse in Holyoke that was completely unusable, and made a presentation to our former <laughs> Don Olver, uh, who then got federal funding. And you can see today the, the Transportation Education Center on Maple Street, where the firehouse used to be in Holyoke, that uh, really thinking about that tapping into federal funding as well locally. Um, but I better move on. <laughs> <laughs> I was move just going to say to, that. <laughs> move on to the next Let section. Me. Can I John? just jump in briefly? Um, so Adrian Terizzi has had her hand up. So I, I wondered, she's one of our, the league is one of our sponsors. So I wonder if we could just allow her to ask her question if it's relevant now. And then, so let me do that. Oh, oh, she put her hand back down. So I guess not. Um, but we do have a question about, oh. Uh, do you- uh, Okay, Adrian, one... you're able to speak. Should be able to talk and ask your so... question. Well, hello everyone. Um, my hand is a computer problem here, but I did want to say I'm following this e extremely interesting conversation and I uh, just want to say thank you so much. I will try to control this erratic uh, uh, raise hand, lower hand, John. Uh, so no I will worries. bow out now. But keep, keep up the good work. I'll continue to listen with my raised, my, my lowered hand. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you, you, Adrian. Um, we have one more question um, oh. about home ownership. So I know we did spend, we had a forum a couple of weeks ago entirely dedicated to home ownership. So I will find the link for that. Um, but from Tracy Zafion, a question about should we only be looking at, at um, rental opportunities or is the trust and other organizations looking at home ownership too? So um, within you know the time that we have, um, if people want to touch on that very briefly, I will go and find the link to our, our previous discussion on that exact topic. And just to let people know, we have uh, Kathleen Anderson and uh, another section, but we are definitely coming back for public comments. So I, I, I hear the, the message that we're going to move along at a, at a tighter clip, so we have uh, time for back and forth. Um, Kathleen, uh, Thank you uh, once again, uh, Kathleen Anderson, who's been doing work uh, in many areas of uh, civil and human rights for many years, is the former president of Amherst NAACP and is uh, the, for, the uh, member, a member of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, and is talking to us tonight about an opportunity to develop tiny homes in Amherst. Thanks, Kathleen. Yes, yes. So often the um, conversation about affordable houses are um, big tall buildings with multiple units in one structure and not a detached house. And I am looking at detached houses, small tiny houses as a way to bring the diversity in housing and the, um, the diversity in housing and the diversity of housing stock. And I, um, I'm particularly uh, attracted to tiny houses. Now I have this first slide 
which is a two car garage. And a definition of a tiny house is equivalent to a two car garage. So I show this, sign, uh, this slide to give people an understanding of what a tiny house on a foundation could look like. Next slide, please. Yep, and another tiny house community um, that can be affordable. Um, often the tiny houses are 400 square feet or less, but a small house could be 800 square feet or less. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a tiny house community or a small house community in New Hampshire. So I'm just showing the uh, variation in the kinds of um, housing designs that can be achieved with a tiny house. Next slide. And another house, uh, another um, village that has a uh, tiny house development. Next slide. So these slides are basically examples of various kinds of communities that are tiny houses or small houses made available. Um, they could be uh, for home ownership or for rental. Next slide, please. So they're livable communities and houses are closer close but they're detached. So you still have the sense of your own single family home. Next slide. Next slide, please. And so the, again, there's our examples of um, neighborhoods. This one is um, an example of uh, Washington state a developer in Washington state that has created a small home or a tiny home community. The next slide please shows the layout for uh, that particular pocket neighborhood. So you can see there are multiple units. I didn't count them before, um, but somebody who's quickly looking, so it looks like they're five, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 25 units um, on this acreage. Next slide. And a charming village walkway, cobblestones. So just another example of a small tiny home or small home community development. Next slide. Next slide, please. So people have a sense of their own home and it's an affordable option. Next slide. Next slide, please. This one is in Maine coastal area. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And finally, in our own state, the example of the Gingerbread cottages in Oak Bluffs on Martha's Vineyard. So there's been uh, examples of uh, affordable houses that can be um, developed. Uh, there's some property in, in Amherst perhaps that is available that would allow the uh, construction of a series of small houses. And that's the end of my slides.
Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, a beautiful diversity of housing that reminds me of uh, a meeting that was sponsored by uh, Rosana Salazar, Caitlin Marquis, and uh, Clark Bankert when they were planning the mobile market and residents of Amherst made beautiful drawings together of their vision of a community. And it was um, in fact, small houses with a big community garden in the middle, lots of community in, in those pictures. Thank you so yeah, much. So some, some, some people who need affordable housing, they don't wanna live in an apartment complex, but would like a detached home. And um, a tiny house is an option to make that possible. Absolutely. I'm going to move us because uh, the time is getting away from us. And um, in this next section, Beyond Affordable Housing, Normalizing Opportunities for Access to Amherst Housing Among Persons of Color. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Francine Rodriguez, the Manager of Community Services uh, for Family Outreach of Amherst, uh, somebody who is a tireless worker for um, residents in our community. It's really nice to, to have you here, Francine. And uh, Donna Cabana is the homeownership coordinator at uh, Valley Development, uh, Cor Development Corporation. Hi, okay. Valley Community Development. And Demetria in, uh, is back with Michelle to discuss normalizing opportunities for access to, to Amherst. Um, I'm going to ask whether we um, have uh, Francine and, and Donna just open up since they are, are, new, are newly joining us uh, on this topic. Um, whoever is, is uh, ready to go first. Sure. I want to thank you all because this has been a really great event and I, you know, there's been a lot of great stuff brought up here tonight. I think we need to go beyond the marketing plan, John. John Hornick gave his outline of what they're going to be looking for for the developers to reach out to the different groups of folks to try to bring people in to apply for this housing. And it is true, until that building's built and people can actually see it, oftentimes people don't apply. And, you know, I have this very same task. Um, we just rolled out a program in Amherst last March and then the world shut down because of COVID. Our in-person meetings were canceled. Doing outreach during COVID was just like a nightmare. How do you reach people when we got to stay six feet apart? Um, but I think it goes beyond that marketing plan, going beyond reaching out to those homeownership, homeownership staff and saying, hey, can you share this in your workshop? You got to call that counselor you know and say, hey, do you have any clients that could use this program? You got to reach out to the person you know at New North Citizens Council and, hey, do you have any folks that you could really share this with? Because I'm really trying to get the word out to get more and more and more people to share um, that opportunity because our usual marketing is not bringing the folks in. So we got to come up with even greater, even greater and more diverse ways to try to reach folks. And, you know, Keith had talked, talking about, you know, his, his, his beginnings and door to door. And, you know, maybe we need to do some more of that. I will tell you, I did an affordable last year and Megan's group with the Pioneer Valley Habitat they have like 200 volunteers and they called so many people. I never had so much, so many people apply for a unit ever, ever. Megan's volunteers really did um, fascinating work. I really got to, I really got to find out every little thing that they're doing to reach people because they did a fabulous job. But I think they just have a really big list and they call all those folks who don't have email addresses. And I think sometimes we just assume everybody has email. Everybody's gonna be able to see it in this electronic format. And we have to go beyond that and beyond our local housing groups and our regional housing groups to try to find people to apply. And there are a number of affordable units in Amherst. There's some units in Pally Village. There's some single family units. I've been involved in a few units in Amherst. And when those come up for resale, um, you know, we, we do some marketing to try to make folks aware of those units. Even if we're not the resale agent of that property, even if the city of Amherst, uh, the town of Amherst is doing that, we still want to make sure that our base knows about that unit and that, you know, as many people possible know about those units that come up for sale. 
I guess that's all I'll say, and I'll let somebody else have an opportunity to speak. Francine, you want to jump in? Let me unmute myself first. Um, this is a great conversation. And as you guys are all, all the panelists are speaking, it's a, a lens into what I do for work on a daily basis. Um, we provide direct services and support and stabilization services and housing. We have a housing support program. Um, and we are the, the folks that provide that access. So when all of you have these developments that are created, we're ensuring that people are applying when the trust created an emergency rental um, arrears program, we are there making sure people have the access to, to be able to stabilize their lives, whether it's through rental arrears. Home ownership has also been an issue um, because families want to stay in Amherst. And I'm when I work with families, I say, well, you know, you're paying $1,600 in rent. Why don't we go and do a first time homeowners class and get yourself a home. You can have a mortgage for that amount of money, but then it comes back to, I want to stay in Amherst. My children want to stay in Amherst schools and they can't afford to buy a home in Amherst. So again, even folks with like section eight and I'm, you know, if they wanted to move from their apartment in Amherst, I have to strongly recommend you stay put because there's not any other units that you're gonna be able to rent with your Section 8 voucher. The rents are just maxed out where there are very few housing um, availabilities for folks that have Section 8. Um, and the increase of rents is just yearly, it never stops. I mean, every year, the fair market rents in Amherst increase, even for the families that have Section 8, their portion is going up, even though their income hasn't gone up because the rent is continuously increasing. So, you know, the, the, the market's not here, the housing market's not here. Um, we need more affordable housing. Um, home, home ownership would be great, but again, it's, it's an issue in Amherst. I think that's the best option for our families with the rents that they're paying. Um, but it comes back to not wanting to leave the community with good schools and they're forced to make that choice. Do I struggle and keep, you know, uh, doubling up with another family in a two bedroom apartment so my kids can have a better education in Amherst. So the struggle is very much here and I've been here for 16 years in the community and I've seen it just getting worse and worse, which is unfortunate. So I'm really glad that we're all coming together to have this discussion and hopefully find a way to move forward and create more affordable housing and more home ownership options in the Amherst community um, for people of color. Thank you so much, uh, Francine. You mentioned the doubling up, and I remember in the spring of 20, with all the all the issues that are going on in the community, and uh, and hearing, you know, from Rosana Salazar and from and, and you all the work that you were doing in outreach to communities during COVID, and the reality that we we have in South Amherst, um, as many as nine people in uh, units with two bedrooms, and that is a, a reality. Uh, Demetria and Michelle, um, this- We don't uh, have very much time. It's almost eight o'clock. Um, yeah, I, I think we'll be more okay. So maybe like one, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to, to add before we go back to Whitney? So to, you're talking to me and Michelle? Yes, or, to, to oh, Michelle sure. And so I just, you know, I appreciate um, kind of laying out rental but you know when we talk about building wealth and working class folks building wealth middle class folks building wealth it's about home ownership and that is how white america has done that for so long and black and brown people have been locked out of the ability to do that it's not that we haven't done it but when we've done it it's usually been the exception and that's what needs to happen here there needs to be some incentive for black and brown folk to um, you know, own homes, to be able to own affordable homes that build stability. And it builds a base here for Amherst and it builds the future. So I just want us to, to really consider that and figure out what are the incentives, what are the ways in which we could do that through you know, what was mentioned, homeowner classes, et cetera. You know, what's the starter home? What does that look like? And are we priced out? Thank you, Dee. I'm going to move on uh, to Whitney Demetrius, advocating for changes at the state level. 
Thank you so much. So I will be quick, <laughs> unlike, unlike what I'm used to being. But I, what I've done in the chat is just shared uh, a full list of our chapel legislative priorities. I won't go into my PowerPoint right now, just based off time. But one of the things, three of the priorities from that long overall list uh, are really focused on fair housing. Right, so we have this fair housing legislative priority that are doing three different things. Right, one is sort of establishing and affirmatively furthering fair housing policy statewide, right? So that cities and towns are examining whether or not just there's discrimination in their programs and sort of reshaping policies, undoing patterns of segregation, right? So we know we have that federally, but we've seen some rescinding of that in the last former administration. And of course, it being reinstated, but we're looking at that in a statewide level. We're also looking at disparate impact, right? How do we, how do we be able to bring um, laws Bring, bring suits rather, right, as it relates to unintended and intended um, policies that have an impact on discrimination, right? So um, something that on its face may not be discriminatory, but has an impact on communities of color, for instance. And so bringing those cases forward on a statewide level, we're looking to enact that particular law. And then lastly, uh, we are looking at an exclusionary zoning policy, which is going to make sure that people are not making um, statements like we don't want to build this housing development because it would make more children in our community, for instance, right? And so, so those are some of the things. And I, I, I'm mindful of the time, but I've also shared our symposium happening later this month uh, that we hope you'll join us in. We'll be talking specifically about some of these workarounds that have to happen when we're creating RFPs when we want to say. Uh, certain things, but we can't, right? We're thinking about racial home ownership, wealth gaps. Um, and so we hope that you'll be able to join us in that conversation. So I'll, I'll, I'll end it there, but also be able to share my slides that have more detail. Thank you so much. I feel like there is so much more to say, and perhaps that's a, a separate panel at another point, John, that's exclusively about the state and federal uh, policies that we need and the funds that we need to have a major increase in uh, both rental and home ownership uh, for all different kinds of families um, in Amherst. So I'd love to, to help with that in any way. Um, people have been really patient and I know John has quite a number of, of questions um, in the chat. I do remember Tracy uh, Zafian being one of the first to ask. And so John, I'm going to um, let you read um, the questions for us if that's okay. Um, since you're in the chat, thank you. Sure, so I think the first one, um, which we've touched on a little bit was about how does home ownership come into play here? Um, not just rentals, but home ownership. Um, and I did share our video from last time, but um, if anyone wants to talk about home, home ownership opportunities, that is our first question. I'll just add a little bit. Um, people should look at the a forum we did last month because there's a lot of information about there there about what three organizations are doing to try to advance home ownership in Amherst and it includes Valley Community Development, uh, Pioneer Valley, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, I'm blocking on the names. Pioneer Valley Habitat. <laughs> Thank you very much. And also the Amherst Community Land Trust. So you can learn more about that in the previous recording. Uh, let me also say that this is a concern of the housing trust. And in some ways, the issues aren't different in developing home ownership opportunities from rental developments. You need to have land and you need to have money. And it appears as if uh, one of the quasi state agencies that f subsidizes housing, mass housing finances, kind of dipping its toe in the water in uh, subsidizing home ownership developments. So that's one thing that we'll be looking at, uh, as well as I said, looking for property. We have other questions. I, I now have actually managed to put the chat on a second screen, John, you'll be proud of me. And um, I'm looking for uh, the next uh, question that we have. Um, you did share the web address uh, to the trust uh, website, I believe. Yes, that is in there and it can pretty easily found on the, the town of Amherst website um, once you get to there. And I, I do see Tracy's uh, question here. Um, 
Is the trust looking uh, to create new affordable housing that is owned by low income households or only rental housing? Was the last affordable housing for owning, not renting, the development on Charles Lane? A neighbor told me that was a Habitat for Humanity project. Has there been affordable housing with units for ownership, not rental, not rental units built since? And she's specifically referring to housing that is restricted to ensure low income housing affordability, not market rate units. Yeah. I, yeah. Question is at 7.38 PM on the chat in case you'd like to see it. No, I think I did say that the housing trust would like to do that. And we have the same barriers. We need property in Amherst and we need funding from the state to help us be able to subsidize uh, low income home ownership. So this question of uh, has there been any since, the answer is no. We, no, there, we have no. not developed anything specifically. But there is home ownership programs in Amherst several times using CDBG funds, right? Yes, we, Valley Community Development has done some programming with the town of Amherst with CDBG. It's been a number of years. Our last program in 2017 and 2018 used CPA funds for home ownership, and those were $50,000 mortgage subsidies. Okay. Uh, there's a question here. Has anyone done an inventory of rental units in Amherst? To me, it seems that a lot of new apartment buildings have been and are being built. And I put the link to the housing production plan, which we did in the chat. There's also a housing market study, as well as the brand new um, study done by the Donahue Institute, which Keith um, wonderfully mentioned today. Yeah, the town of Amherst does keep track of rental housing because we have a rental registration bylaw. Um, all of the available rental units are maintained in a data database uh, by the uh, housing commissioner, by Rob Mora. Um, again, that data isn't easily accessible, but it is available and we can query that database if people have questions. But in terms of the advocacy that we would have to do to you know, have enough of uh, an infusion of state and federal funds to really uh, move the needle here, I'm hearing the need, at least in this question, maybe I'm reading into it, uh, for you know, very clearly available information on what percentage of rentals our market value, what is that market uh, value uh, versus uh, affordable rental, and then also the you know, number and percentage of, of affordable housing. I mean, just by way of anecdote, um, you know, there's a many uh, informal barriers that we haven't talked about discrimination enough, I think, tonight. I can tell you personally that when we moved to Amherst, we had two professional jobs and you can try to rent and have a sudden list of documents required. Um, if you come from another state, you don't have any way of knowing whether it's discriminatory or not. I do know that my husband who is from Puerto Rico and has a heavy accent would receive a list of twice as many documents as I would receive in Amherst asking uh, for the most you know, simple rental. And if people look long enough through your records, they may find that you paid a student loan late and have an, an excuse to, to leave you out of an apartment. And that's two people you know, with professional salaries. Um, and again, very transparent here. The only reason we're in this home is because a previous owner decided to give us a rent to own informally. And that was the only, the only way that two professionals' uh, salaries could actually afford in our bracket to, to buy a home here. And when we did go to buy, we had accrued an escrow account, a down payment. We were then penalized, not by the credit union, but by the federal lender who apparently frowns on owner agreements. And we were then uh, charged for a separate loan at a variable rate. Again, in that moment uh, with our busy lives, did we have time to investigate whether or not that was discriminatory? Likely. And so, and this is at a level of a lot of privilege <clears throat> professionals. And so we can only imagine the kind of discrimination that people are encountering. And I would love to give uh, Francine and others working, um, you know, in the community and others just a chance to talk a little bit more because I feel like we, we didn't 
we didn't t talk enough about all of those informal barriers and the feeling welcome and, and those sort of issues that come up and having experienced it personally not very many years ago I'd love to, to hear um, a little bit more about that. Yeah um, I can say myself and my caseworkers have definitely observed clients of color or families that we work with of color are under more of a microscope when applying for housing. Um, they're scrutinized more, they're asked to provide more things. Um, they seem to be treated a bit with more suspicion all the time. Um, and if I've, I've experienced where a housing issue that does arise, arrive with a, a tenant, um, the level of punitive action that's taken against a person of color opposed to a white person is way larger than in any scale that we could imagine. Um, language barriers are a big issue as well. Um, there are not people that speak the language um, or documents that are not in their language or even accessing documents. The level of things that you need to provide um, is a job in its own. And it's, it's very difficult if you don't know where to get these documents. If you're from another country, you're newly arrived in the United States, you don't know even where to get any of these things. Um, so that is a big piece of what our agency does is help folks, you know, acts have access to affordable housing, to public assistance benefits, so they don't have to make those decisions of, do I pay my rent or do I just not buy groceries this week, which in Amherst is a daily struggle for the families that we serve. It is um, something that they have to, especially you can imagine with the pandemic, it's tripled the amount of um, disparities our families are facing in Amherst, um, especially undocumented families and people of color. It's, it's devastating right now. And, and we have seen a significant increase of people needing help to stay housed um, and a large number of people getting brought to court and not knowing their rights and thinking, I got to leave, they're taking me to court and we have to be there to say, no, you don't, these are your rights. But, you know, I often wonder if how many of those people that I don't know or that don't know us that have just up and left their apartments, especially in this pandemic, because they were told they had to. And so our, our job is to make sure people are aware of their rights and aware of what is illegal and discriminatory in practice for real for landlords, which happens often here in Amherst. Absolutely, Francine. I see Kathleen and then Whitney, please. Yes. Ahead, white people, white people, here's your job. Talk to your white people about this stuff. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, I think it's important for us. Uh, to be talking about these issues, but also knowing where we can go. So I appreciate your comment, Francine, about what you guys are able to do to advocate for folks. Uh, I shared in the chat, which I hope all uh, the attendees can also see, but the Massachusetts Fair Housing Center, right? They actually will help folks, right? Regular folks who have day-to-day -day lives to actually file the complaint, to do testing, to do mystery shopping that will then support your claim of, um, of your housing discrimination issue, right? Will help to move that needle forward, filing at the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination, right? So you're not alone in that uh, there are agencies there to really assist you. But one of the things I did wanna highlight in our conversation today, as we talk about what can we do, is really thinking about fair housing committees, local fair housing committees. There has been historically a, a uh, sort of a decrease of active fair housing committees, right? So each local municipality uh, has historically had a active board or, or committee really working on those issues year round, not just in the, during April, but a, a committee that's working to make sure that it's being implemented on an every level um, and doing that work, right? So there's examples of great ones in Newton and in Cambridge that are doing great work. Is there an active, and I looked on the website uh, earlier today, it looks like it kind of like dissolved and kind of was in a different committee and sort of a, an umbrella committee, but is that something that folks in the community think is important? That's a, a, a very important point. And I appreciate you moving us to the final section of what can we do. 
uh, Fair Housing Committee uh, has, and I don't know the history of that, John, or anybody who was here who participated in it, uh, but it's a really important question. I do notice that I didn't see this before. I was only looking at the chat and actually we do have a couple of uh, statements in the Q&A uh, that I had not seen. And uh, Shalini Ball is our a town, uh, as a counselor for our district uh, five and uh, has written in here to address the systemic issues of income inequities and shortage of housing supply. We need to engage our colleges and institutions related to hiring and retention and in looking at creative solutions like tiny homes we need to engage other stakeholders like developers and banking. Do you have suggestions on how to engage different stakeholders to address these systemic issues and not work in silos? I think that's a, a huge um, point here to make that um, we, we thought was interested in affordable housing and um, often since we were talking about this today in a conversation I was in with some folks end up talking to each other a lot. Um, but we need to um, to branch out to other stakeholders. And as uh, Kathleen was mentioning, uh, all, whether they're um, of different races, of different institutions, and bringing them into the conversation. You know, there's a question about housing developments being built. Seems like a lot of apartments being built right now. Um, you know, I also live here in Amherst. I think those apartments are for students. They're not for, for, for um, working folks. So those are... Um, uh, we need to bring everybody to the table, the university and all others who are who have all these things that kind of distort and affect the housing market to be part of the solution. And and right now, there's there's th there are things to be advocating for, um, both at the state level. There are housing resources that are in play today uh, to help people afford housing, whether that be the Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program, which we're looking for a significant increase in this year. It's been increasing, but we need to, to help people pay for the housing, the renters. Um, there can be more programs and more resources for home ownership to the point uh, that was raised before to address the racial wealth gap. Um, there are, um, uh, when federal resources do come, we need to be advocating East West to make sure that uh, here in the West, we are getting our fair due of those resources and the good work of uh, Amherst and other towns in terms of really documenting what the housing needs uh, and challenges are. Uh, need to be front and center, but we all need to know them. And then we need to bring the business community in. We need to bring the other institutional players in to be advocating alongside us as unusual suspects in that conversation. Because when, when John shows up, they know exactly what John's going to talk about. Here comes John Hornick. He's going to talk to us about housing. Check the box. He talked about it. But if you get the chancellor of UMass talking about it, if you get the, the head of Cooley talking about it, if you get um, some of these other institutional leaders uh, advocating alongside you because it makes a difference for them too. It makes a difference in, in, in terms of attracting, retaining employees. It right. makes a difference in how much they need to, uh, how they pay people. Um, all those things have an effect on all of us. So this is a shared issue. This is not just about those of us um, who have been discriminated against. It is, that's key. We're at the bottom of the barrel there in that regard. But we need to make this a collective issue and pull those folks into this conversation to make it a, um, to, to get them um, advocating alongside us. And I think we can be leveraging not only federal resources, but private resources to do much more um, from those institutions as well. Excellent points. Uh, the business community uh, in particular, a business roundtable on uh, employment and housing would be, would be really incredible. Um, there is one more uh, question in here referring to the statistics that you were sharing, Keith. It uh, says, um, these did not mention that the rental homes, but you just mentioned that now, um, are 50% absentee landlord student rentals. The population that is stressed even more, stressed by poor people by these kinds of exclusions. Has Amherst looked to the CLT model? I'll need help with what the CLT model is for wide swaths of land like Dudley Street or Champlain, Burlington, uh, Vermont uh, does. This place is a great deal uh, you know, of pressure that requires big solutions. Um, so this is about different models that are being used in other places. 
Yeah, CLT refers to community land trust, and we do ah, have okay. a community land trust. Um, well, I think we're a bit past time, so I'm going to wrap up quickly. Just a couple of things. Um, uh, we do need more resources, and we do need to do a better job of reaching out to developers and other people in the business community to get their support to institutional leaders, as both Shalini and, and Keith said. So anyway, I want to thank all the people who have presented tonight, as well as our co-sponsors. Again, I'll mention the League of Women Voters of Amherst and the town of Amherst. Uh, I also want to thank our excellent moderator, Isolda Ortega Bustamante. Thank you for keeping us on track as best you could uh, and for making many interesting comments. Again, I want to tell people to be sure to look for the following four events that are coming up later this month. April 27th at 6.30 p.m., a symposium on reparations sponsored by Reparations for Amherst. The next afternoon, April 28th, 2 p.m., there'll be a discussion of the Greater Springfield Housing Study um, that Keith mentioned in his presentation that'll be sponsored by Wayfinders and the Donahue Institute. The next day, April 29th at 1.30, um, there is the Fair Housing Symposium that my good friend Whitney Demetrius mentioned and that she's organizing. It's sponsored by CHAPA and it has the subtitle, Building the Framework for a More Equitable Massachusetts. And finally, next month on May 25th at 6.30 p.m., the Housing Coalition has its last of three forums. This one will focus on climate, sustainability, and affordable housing. And uh, I hope you all look forward to that event as well. Before, so, we, close you. Out, before we close out, before we close out, um, I just want to remind people to contact your senator and your uh, representative and demand that they support and pass HR 40 and S 40. Those are uh, reparations bills in the House of Representatives nationally and in the Senate nationally. Also contact your local area representative for reparations for Massachusetts. Thank you. Thanks. And just to people don't know, our local representative in the state legislature is Mindy Dom. Our local state senator is Joe Comerford. Right. And it's easy to find them online. And our national representatives are Jim McGovern, who's uh, our congressman, and obviously Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey, who are senators. And Mindy so, Dom just put her, um, she's on the uh, the event tonight, and she just put her email address in the chat. Great, thanks, Thank Mindy. Thank you for always, you, always being supportive and always being here. John, I had that we were going till 8.30. I hope I didn't abuse the time and you wanted to end at 8.15, so. No, I, I, I said eight o'clock and we stretched it to eight. Oh, we stretched it. Already. Well, already. Well, that's me then. The topic so. was too interesting. I appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, what are we committed to doing next? I heard so much from all of you. And I think, John, we're asking you to do two more forums at least. And uh, we heard the business one, we heard advocacy and the activism on the ground was discrimination. So thank you so much, John, for all of your work. I really wanna have a round of applause for, for both Johns uh, and, and everybody who helped organize this, Michelle, Dee, Matthew, and all of the, all of the organizers, who was not me, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Uh, I shouldn't mention the Housing Trust meets on the second Thursday night of every month. Um, you can go to the town website to find uh, the access for reaching us. And people are certainly invited to discuss these ideas at further length when the Housing Trust meets. Again, thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. That was a lot of information. Yeah. Well done, John. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Are Jane. You I make, appreciate your support. Yeah. Are you going to make this information that was put in the chat um, someplace publicly? Because once this chat, um, once this session ends, that that information will not be available. So, is there a way to um, access the different links that were in, inserted? Yeah, this is Nate. I um, <laughs> I was googling that while this was ending, and um, I'm recording it to the cloud and. I, I, you know, I think it's going to be saved. Um, I'm trying to figure out how I can copy and paste it before I end this as well, because um, yeah, I don't have the save to... function that Zoom says should be there. Um, you just, so I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. I, I agree, I'd like to keep it. <laughs> yeah, we will also have the recording, Kathleen, but I agree, it would be good to have. Yeah, but I have the, references the, record, well. the recording doesn't show the chats. No, no, you're right, I understand. Yeah. yeah, no, Zoom, yeah, Zoom said if you enable the chat and you're recording it to the cloud, that it should uh, save the chat as a separate file. Oh, uh, okay. So I um I don't know enough though about Zoom um, to feel boring. confident in that. So I um I've been trying to copy and paste all the chat and I'm having problems with it, but I'm 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 gonna try to figure that out. I'm not gonna end I'm not gonna end this until I can figure it out. So everyone else can leave. I scheduled this till 10. So I have an hour and a half uh -huh. <laughs> before Zoom ends it on me. Thank you, Nate. Yep. Yeah, thank, thank you, Nate. Nate. I much appreciate it. For Nate. So I think you'll be able to find it once you go to the recording. I've seen that chat show up in the yeah. yeah I just I, I I you know I'm on I um yeah I'm unsure. So it's just one of those things. Yeah. I don't want you know I'd like to make sure before. Better be safe than sorry. Yeah, right. I'm trying to paste it too, and usually it does. I don't know why it's not doing it. Yeah, for either. other people's webinars, there's a recording function that you can request that it will copy the chat into a file. It stays on my computer, but I didn't try to do that this evening. Uh oh. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I'm going to have to look at, you know. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to work on it. Good night. I'm okay. leaving. Yeah, no. <laughs> Good night. Bye. Thank you all. Uh, thanks, John. I'll, um, I'll, I'll work on this for a little bit and then. Um, okay, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for all your help, Nate. It's been okay. great. Oh, no, thanks, John. Yeah, this is really great. I can at least take a screenshot of all of it and then we can figure out how to. Yeah, how good. To it is not saved. All right. 